the seeing is believing. Yeah. yeah. And I will say with the insulin levels, it, this is anecdotal, but I'm correlating insulin levels with coronary calcium scores. It's like, oh, your insulin level's up. What is your LAD coronary calcium score? Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. Today we're talking to John Madony of Dillon, Montana, who runs a family practice and deploys a lot of personal knowledge around metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance and blood measurements to track that in order to help his patients be successful in resolving their metabolic disease. So great to see you, John, here in Seattle this time. Yes, I appreciate being able to visit with you. Uh, it's great, and uh, we talked a couple of times before in San Diego, always fascinating conversations, patient stories, but you, I suppose several years ago, kind of discovered insulin resistance and the importance of insulin and glucose and chronic disease. And did you do that through your own research or it came down from the medical bodies? One of my colleagues had me read the book by Gary Tobbs, Good Calories, Bad Calories. And when I read that, it was an aha moment because it explained the futility of my work for about 20 years. Oh, they're strong words. <laughs> I guess it, not totally futile, but mostly apply the drug to the symptom kind of phenomena. Right. When I say futility, I would be referring to helping people with metabolic illness instead of just treating with more and more medication to control the numbers. Now I knew how to start deprescribing. Right, so you're not only improving their health, but you're doing it in parallel to removing medications, which is kind of that's just a fantastic combination, obviously. Oh, yeah, it was very satisfying. I didn't know there was a term deprescribing, but having to overcome the inertia of pulling back medication was unique, and that started. That was very satisfying because this was for patients that I've known for years, so it's like now I've got an answer, how we can stop this endless progression of it's a new year, it's a new drug. Right, and that's reminiscent of Dr. David Unwin's story in the UK where he was close to retirement, discovered what you discovered, and suddenly realized he enjoyed his, his, his role, his vocation, his job, because now he could actually intervene, help people, and de-prescribe medications for the first time in his career, a 40-year career. Right, so I kind of say now I've found the best retirement plan is enjoying your work. Yeah, it's huge. If you can... Um, yeah, make your hobby or job, you know, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. So I'm guessing you have fantastic patient stories and we'll get into some of those. But uh, you'd see quite a lot of people, even though America has enormous obesity issues, you'd see quite a lot of people who are tofu or not so obese outside appear healthy and yet their blood markers clearly show you with your expertise that they're at really high risk, just like an obese person. Yeah, and come to think of it, I'm one of a severe tofu in that I had fatty liver disease diagnosed by biopsy. The liver enzymes were that bad. And the response I got was, oh, you don't have hepatitis C, B, or hemochromatosis. And I was like, okay. And then over time I've learned that it's a fructose disease, which is easily explained by my habit of um, minimal alcohol consumption and vast amounts of fructose consumption from age five. Oh, so you've had a lifetime really of uh, most of your life until a few years ago of, of eating high sugar diet. Yeah. And I was also a very diligent um, low fat dieter. So this all changed. It was very life changing personally. and It helps me empathize with patients, but I don't practice based on what you know, what I did for me necessarily is the science of it. Right, it is completely science-based. And even though Gary Taub's book tipped you off to the enormity of insulin and glucose dynamics and, and their connection to chronic disease, you really then, of course, took that as a springboard to go and research yourself, I think, with right. your access to the medical literature. Yeah, being that I can go to the National Library of Medicine online, PubMed, and 
type in insulin and a chronic disease and it just tumbles out of the computer, it's almost to the point where you don't have to keep, a, you can just do a new search if you want to show somebody an example. Like I work with medical students and it's like, hey, watch this, insulin, this, boom, here's a paper. I've never read this before, but it's slam dunk. Yeah, and myriad yeah. papers on any. I, I used to say that years ago as well. I mean, putting Google insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia and the chronic disease mm -hmm. of your choice, yeah. right? Modern disease, and you're going to get a ton of hits. And it's yeah. physiologic. It's yeah. not, we're not talking about um, correlation. We're talking about mechanism. Yeah, and pretty much validated. Yeah. Nothing is 100% proven in any field, but this is right, right up at the top. And when you start implementing it and you say, I think that your edema in your legs is from high insulin and the insulin level drops and the ankles appear, what can you say? And now you're on a less blood pressure medication using, you know, one sixth the amount of insulin and it's like, oh, this is, we're on to something here. Yeah, John, and you mentioned earlier actually this morning when we were chatting that you know, people who come in with high or highish insulin, you nearly always now find another sign also. Rarely do you find high insulin isolated. You'll see hypertension with it, or you might see some central obesity, something else. Exactly. Um, I haven't found somebody with high insulin that I didn't suspect it. Um, and I have, um, I should say that this, I've been able to start with this work was no insulin levels using Richard Bernstein's book as a guide to what foods stimulate insulin. And that's what I, I kind of started with, making up a, um, recommendations based on what foods don't trigger insulin release. Um, and then the technology is advanced. Then comes the Dexcom, which I wore for a month total myself. Now we have the Freestyle Libre. Um, where I'm just prescribing that to um, anybody who will take one because it's such an eye-opener to see what um, foods do. The classic one now is um, skim milk and cornflakes and it'll drop your jaw, what it's doing to your insulin. And um, then within our hospital, I'm very fortunate that our hospital has um, high-tech equipment where we can get an insulin level within hours. So it can, in a sense, get a stat insulin level, a beta hydroxybutyrate, the ketone level, using the Freestyle Libre, you can put that together and you can see so much that if you, the lab results came in different days, it'd be hard to put it together. But when a patient's sitting in front of you with the results all came in today and we can talk about what you did yesterday, the scene is believing. Yeah. And I will say with the insulin levels, it, this is anecdotal, but I'm correlating insulin levels with coronary calcium scores. It's like, oh, your insulin level's up. What is your LAD coronary calcium score? And it seems like there's a relationship. Right, and actually in the literature, yeah, there, there is limited, there are limited papers on insulin. There are many papers on insulin and future heart disease and future diabetes, of course, but there's relatively limited ones that have coronary calcium. Yeah. So that's really interesting. And I'm hearing more, it's very heartening. I obviously work on behalf of Irish Heart Disease Awareness and David yeah. Bobbitt. Yeah. And our main goal is to get information out on the calcification yeah. scan to save the middle risk, especially non-obese, non-smokers, right. give them a heads up. But to your point, I'm hearing more and more doctors coming back now all over the world at conferences, emails, all beginning to do calcification scans when they actually realize the huge value of them. So you've been starting to do those and with the American Heart Association putting it in their guidelines, that was a big good thing for, for freedom so that I'm not um, too far away out from guideline. But the area where I'm looking at is I've had some people that had a shockingly high score and low insulin, and it's only recently I'm really making an effort to find out what more can I do for you to reduce your risk of coronary artery disease and lowering your insulin. Because even the standard calculator is in effect an insulin resistance calculator because it looks at um, blood pressure, um, 
HDL cholesterol and diabetes. And you say, well, if I lower your um, insulin, it changes all the numbers in the um, American Heart Calculator. So it was really an insulin resistance calculator disguised. But if you don't have excessive insulin, insulin resistance, now what do I do for you? And that's my current study is because I don't want to do a test on someone and then say, oh, this is too bad and I have nothing to offer but a statin because I'm not going to hold back on the statin. But it's like, there, I know you need more. Yeah, and you are, by doing calcification scans, I mean, besides saving lives by highlighting the people truly at risk, way better than the risk calculator, you also begin to get an insight into those uh, less common scenarios. I mean, you find someone with a high score and they're clearly got a high HOMA or they're diabetic. It's, it's simple. The first steps, besides medications, is to start reducing their diabetes. Right. But when you get a guy who has no apparent issue, apparent issue, right with insulin or hyperglycemia, then you've got to go deeper. And I think you mentioned you saw a podcast I did with Bill Blanchett, cardiologist. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, maybe yes. talk about that. Um, what I did on my flight here is that I, um, on the plane, I took detailed notes on that because so many of the things that Bill Blanchett mentioned are so safe. And I know we've talked about, um, about maybe I have to do a little more homework on it, but it's still it's like, I have some things to offer you that um, way that maybe they are not good population interventions, like giving too many people aspirin, you're gonna end up with a complication somewhere along the way. But if you can focus um, thing, um, basically almost they fall into the supplement category because they're over the counter, but could help. And I won't go into detail on that because I'm still, that's my study of the weekend. Um, is to say now I have more to offer and these are pretty benign if your risk is high. I will say with the coronary calcium score, when you see somebody in their 60s with a zero score that and has um, uh, the risk calculator said that they were high enough risk to be on meds, that does make your day because then you just say, oh, and you're, you made it in a sense and we can follow you along, but it's gonna be, we're not gonna worry about you. Yeah, I guess someone in their 60s, maybe five, six, seven years, recheck the, the score possibly, yeah. but they're, they're in a safe place. But there are many more anecdotes coming out now. Um, they're not documented in the published literature, but I'm getting a lot of them of 60-year-olds and even late 60s, zero scores, no measurable disease. But they were all candidates, obviously, for, for drugs because age is the biggest risk factor. Right. So we're going to see a lot more of that. Probably the really crucial thing is to catch, though, the guys who are in their 40s or 50s who have no apparent risk factors that are very significant. They're middle risk. And they don't look obese. They don't smoke. But the calcification scan might throw out someone with a 200, a huge risk. And you, you're also coming across some of those. Right. And also, um, so now I think I have more tools to work with. And it's things that I've actually de-prescribed based on um, maybe misinformation, where I've taken away a fish oil or a niacin in the wrong person. And I'm, th that's what I'm studying. But I also have to say that I'm, I have a little concern about the coronary calcium scores that the data was um, based on a healthier population than the current population. So maybe we need to start checking sooner. And because we're getting the, um, younger cancers, younger diabetes, the amount of um, young men in particular, well, men and women that I meet in the, my half day a week in a walk-in clinic, it is so hard to not just say, stop, I want you, I've got to bring you into a primary care setting and treat your insulin resistance now, you know, because it's, it's so sad to see guys that are in their 30s that are not gaining three pounds a year, but 20 because and um so anyway thinking about the coronary calcium score earlier and to follow it along just call it like a mammogram um type of a concept but it might and it'll come out because there's as we get more information about what to do for these people what to tell them th then you want to know because if you get test results that cooled me off a bit is if you don't have a baseline oh, what do I do? Your score is 
250 and I get email from my patient, I saw my score, I feel sick. <laughs> and it's like, oh, but fortunately one of the persons that was, they were diabetic and it's like, oh, you're diabetic and you're high insulin, you know what that means, you have plenty of reserve to just reverse the disease. Yeah, as shown by Verta and yeah. many other studies, we know now how to attack it. The people who don't have apparent diabetes, of course, then as you mentioned, and it's something you're going to be digging into more, there's a whole range of, of other potential causes like vitamin mineral deficiencies or heavy metal contamination. So it is a challenge for the medical profession actually that the calcium score they're not so familiar with, but as it gets used more and more and with the 2018 AHA guidelines, we're going to see this, yeah we're going to start finding all the people at high risk and some of them will not have an obvious driver for their calcification. Mm -hmm. but, but that's okay because, you know, we can't hold off from using the best tool to identify the at risk and to save them, try and save them, mm -hmm. just because it may throw up some awkward questions. Those awkward questions are going to create huge learning. Right. You know, it's going to be amazing actually. Yes, and um, even with um the thought of the, how important dental health is to coronary artery disease. As a primary care doctor, you at least have intuited that poor dental health is correlated with poor general health. And there, there's a lot of correlation causation issue, but um, I've had some patients, their health did improve when they got all their teeth out, <laughs> which is sad, but they were just you know portals of entry. <laughs> Yeah, and that is, there are many places in the human body where you have an interface with the world, with the non-self, yeah. with potential injuri injurious agents. And of course, the gut is a huge one. If you have leaky yeah. gut, you yeah. bring in foreign proteins, mm. cause autoimmune, mm. and heart disease yeah. can be accelerated. But yeah, that's another interface, your gums. Uh, interestingly, Bill, I know, mentioned that one, and, and I agree, yeah. John, that I always wondered how much is correlation with bad diet that gives you gum yeah. disease, and how much is actual causal. And I think, yeah, it's both, but you can address both together. Right, and there are some times where we have to acknowledge that the correlation causation isn't really essential because there's a immediate benefit of keeping your dental health is just a part of sense of well-being. And, and that's something that I, I'll just think of right now is that when I got the, um, uh, wheat out of my diet, I think, because I don't know if it would be all the um, sugar starch, canker sores went away. You know, well, that's such a nice thing to not have. Yeah. And that had been plagued me my whole life. Yeah, I've heard so many stories from people now. It's, it's a deluge at this stage, to be quite honest, and a lot of them come my way where completely unexpected issues like acne or psoriasis or skin conditions or joint aches or mental fog or tiredness, the myriad modern chronic ailments, it depends on the individual person, their individual physiology and how they're affected by bad food. But fixing bad food can have this enormous population effect, oh. a beneficial effect. Yeah, that, um, the amount of anecdotes of good things that have happened when I was just focusing on, I wish you didn't take as many blood pressure medications or medications for diabetes or cholesterol, and then the good ripple effect of that, which I don't promise to people, but I surely enjoy hearing the new good, like mental well-being. I haven't prescribed it for um, psychiatric alone, but it should, like, to quote one of my patients, I'm different, you know, and it's like that sinks in, you know, this. Yeah, there's often, well, some, some part of it is when people lose weight and, and you know, they, they feel great about that, but to be honest, that's the small part. There's a direct neurological effect, I think, and you're right, it can't be promised, but it just happens in a huge proportion of cases, and uh, right. it, people are always commenting on this. On the more extreme end now, there are some amazing stories coming out, and they're true, they're not stories, but they're not published yeah. in the literature. Uh, one guy had bipolar for 20 years of meds and not being able to work, and he went ultra low carb keto and was off meds within weeks, and that's a year ago, mm -hmm. and he's back working. Yeah. Now, we gotta be careful with N equals ones, but the sheer volume of stories like that yeah. are very gratifying. This is really helping people. And 
I have to say somewhat tongue in cheek that there's some folks say oh, may, they should sign a consent form saying I might have to go back to, I might return to the workforce. And it's like, I'm sorry, I didn't warn you that something might change. I've seen people where they say I'm never going to be off disability and then over time they're looking for work. They actually feel like it and yeah. want to. It's yeah. like, yeah, when you go from a bad diet to a good diet, you not only begin to lose weight as one example and lower your risk for cardiovascular and other disease, of course, but you also begin to get more energy, feel better. Ironically, that in actually encourages you to do more exercise. You feel like doing more. So you get a double whammy yeah. win. And that's an, another thing. Um, I work with a fair number of folks that are um, not even ambulatory with weight loss, they're seriously ill. And to see the, how they can come back to life, is, it's really gratifying. And um, with all the tools we have now, it's, it's amazing. I had a gentleman who, um, he wore his continuous glucose monitor for the first two weeks, got, became non-diabetic after 14 years. Um, and then after the second two weeks, he said, why do I need this? And I had to respond, of, you don't need it because you've learned all there is to know. What's, what can you do with a 90-something blood sugar day in, day out? And no spikes and, after and meals. And no spikes and no meds. Yeah, that's, that's the holy grail, really. But more and more people are achieving this through, to be honest, doctors like yourself who have become knowledgeable on what the main drivers are and yeah. know how to pull them back. In my case, um, I've been wearing the CGM since last August, the Freestyle Libre. And the good thing about that is that it's accessible um, if you want it, in a sense, because the um, reader um, or receiver costs somewhere around $70. And the um, uh, sensors that you wear um, are 40 to $70 for two weeks. So if your curiosity is there and you realize the potential health benefit, um, it can be very valuable. And I keep wearing mine because I learn new things all the time and it took quite a while to realize that exercise raises your blood sugar some and in somebody that's eating a, a diet that doesn't stimulate excessive insulin production, your fluctuations are basically due to activity. And it can unmask things like sleep apnea or um, other, you know, stressors, you say, why is there so much fluctuation in blood sugar? So I find them really valuable and to keep wearing it myself. And as I was um, said when we were talking before, um, I have what we would, I call type 2 physiology because the other day I ate some granola with um, sweetened yogurt at a conference and my blood sugar on the Freestyle Libre read 210. And if I would have done a finger stick, it might have been 180. But I have done the correlation. I wasn't able to at that moment. So you see, you see all these things in yourself. Then when your patients are calling you and um, showing you pictures of their um, readings, you, you start to understand why. And you realize the counter-regulatory hormones are huge. Yeah, so you have got a rapid feedback now yeah. on bad things and also an insight and awareness into not bad things, like you grow to understand that exercise or gearing up for an event can raise the blood glucose, and that's okay, that's part of the yeah. physiology. But, but most importantly, you can do the finger prick or the CGM, eat to your meter, and spot those problematic foods. And everyone has different problematic foods. Right. Just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from David Bobbitt and the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity. For middle-aged people, it is imperative to find out your heart attack risk by getting a CT scan of the heart and your CAC score. The new IHDA.ie website has all the scan resources. Please support us by visiting and sharing widely. Knowing your score, you can take action to stop the disease process and save your own life. It can even be as simple as removing sugar, refined carbs and seed oils, i.e. processed food, from your diet. And now we return to the conversation. And that's one I've got to say hats off to Dr. Bernstein. He had made comments about um, colors of peppers. And that was the only thing that I just dismissed. And... Um, it turns out that eating colored peppers shows up on my CGM. 
And so it's it's an interesting thing. Yeah, and you know what? I just thought of, you triggered a thought there. We recently did a documentary with Irish football stars from the 90s. Mm -hmm. Top guys, still in great shape now, very little obesity. And we got a lot of guys with a calcium scan, a huge score, needed immediate follow-up, and their doctors thought they were fine, and they were not overweight. I mean, muscular guys. But the interesting thing was, they have begun now to use the meters because they've been informed mm -hmm. by, not necessarily by their own doctors, but they're, they're getting to grow and, and learn. And one guy was telling me, when I eat beetroot, I like beetroot, that's kind of healthy, but when I eat beetroot, I can go up to um, 180, 190. And this person is very driven because he's got a high score, he knows you can intervene and stop it progressing, so there's all the hope there to stop that event he might have got. And he's also getting all this feedback as you describe right. it. He's trying different foods. He has porridge and honey, which he used to always eat. And he looks at his meter and says, oh, oh, I mean, much smaller portion is needed or maybe eat some eggs, healthy yeah. eggs. Yeah. Mm. Another interesting one on the CGM is um, seeing how once it gets into the summer months, how leaving the dinner table more quickly to get to my garden has a beneficial effect. And that's, that's one of my um, things that I like to teaches that like from the if you actually start in the garden and you combine it with the healthy animal products you know it's a, sort of a continuum but even just having that I want to leave the dinner table to go pull some weeds can improve your blood sugars because you you do eat a little less and calories we don't I never count calories and I'm a numbers guy but I'm allergic to the thought of counting a calorie but still volume matters and if you just keep eating, you aren't going to get all your weight loss goals. And so many people need weight off. Yeah, probably more primarily, they need the metabolic health. I mean, even yeah. an insulin sensitive right. overweight person, that's the big goal. But yet, in America particularly, but all around the world, we've, we've got a huge challenge. But that thing about getting up, actually, I remember there was a story, um, well, historical fact, that the Romans, I believe, used to always, as a policy, not fully understanding it, after meals would walk around the amphitheater or whatever. And they knew that right after a meal was a great time to walk it off. And of course what they're doing is they're keeping their blood sugar lower after the influx from their meal. It's great timing to do right. something after yeah. a meal, yeah. Not just for calories. Yeah. So any other patient stories? Of course, for several years, you, you've obviously got a lot of patients you're helping at this stage. One of my mm. um, best patient stories was I have a patient that has been my patient for 21 years. He'd be happy if I used his name, but there's no need to. But um, in a rural community, um, people, if they saw this, they knew they could figure out who I might be talking about. We spent from 19, I met him on an ambulance run in 1997 where because of his obesity, he couldn't be brought to the hospital. So the ambulance took me to his house. And um, I, he was in a diabetic almost coma from over overdose of uh, sulfonylurea. Brought him to the hospital, kept him on every, he had to eat around the clock for a couple days to get the sulfonylurea out of his system. And he was a 350 pound gentleman. Already had Charcot feet, the broken bones in the feet from diabetic neuropathy. This is in 1997. Fast forward to, um, 2017, so 20 years later, he comes in the hospital in heart failure, and I had just learned about fasting, which I had practiced on myself for a couple months, so the intermittent fasting, and so I thought, now I know what to do for this gentleman. Um, I can, and I talked to him about this the night after he was admitted. He didn't eat another, he has almost been perfect keto since. He went to a nursing home because he's wheelchair bound, yeah. went to a nursing home for three weeks for rehab, and the next week he started working there two days a week as the activities coordinator. In his 70s, here's somebody coming out of disability of 20 years spontaneously. He is not technically diabetic. He has not on any diabetes medications, and he went from 410 to 240 some pounds in a wheelchair and when your patients are excited because 
they have a narrower wheelchair and they can go through the doors easier. That is amazing. And the neat thing about this gentleman and I was we laugh about the bad advice I gave him. The whole, if you would eat whole wheat instead of white flour, you would get your metabolism together. And we can laugh about it because I did tell my patients I was wrong. When it comes to metabolic syndrome, if you don't know about the insulin um, uh, and all of that, you can, it's just hitting your head against the wall. And it was so funny because here's a guy I'm preaching whole wheat to. As I gained weight and um, in front of him, I gained about 30 pounds while I was giving him over the four years that I worked with him. I left the area and came back and got him back as a patient much later. So those are the things where it's just like every month we have like a reunion and it's like I'm down a little bit more and this is um, a year and a half into the weight loss and it's still marching down in a wheelchair. In a wheelchair, which of course and, means he's very limited in exercise. Yeah, but and as I we, have a bunch of those patients wow. where it's like you're in a wheelchair, lost 100 pounds. You know, it's like, yeah. yeah. And, and el relatively older, like his yeah. 60s and 70s, yeah. and it's, still never too late. Right. And it, it kind of, though, it really epitomizes or it brings to the forefront the incredible power of the correct dietary intervention. You know, the trials were done and there was a lot of variability and they never did low enough carb and there were lots of other flaws and they claimed that there's not a huge difference. But we have myriad N equals ones. Oh, he's like, a one meal a day. Yeah. OMAD, one meal a day. Because that's similar. what worked for him. Yeah. And to have, you know, so, so much better in his sense of well being. And it was like to go from, I was shy to go to the locker room in high school to, I'm satisfied that I got this problem. I've got the answer, even though I'm, I can't get up and walk freely. He can get out of his chair and take a couple of steps. Mm. It's like, it's just, I got my answer and I'm 70. It's like, it's, it's amazing. So yeah. I deal with a lot of people that are um, really very seriously damaged. And that those are, um, it's very satisfying to see people come alive. Even, because it's, uh, life is mentally alive. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. you can still be um, pretty debilitated and still be happy to be a going thing. I don't know how yeah. else to put it. <laughs> oh no, you're absolutely right. I mean, no, to, to have that joie de vivre, to engage with life, if you lose that, like that gentleman would have, you really have no, it's a dark place. Yeah. You're looking down the barrel of a gun. Yeah. When you recover then, as you described yeah. he did and all the others you've yeah. helped, you know, they're getting this lease of life back. They're getting another shot. There's something huge about that. Right. Yeah. And if you're running activities in a nursing home that has been barely open because of unable to get enough staff, I could almost imagine that the nursing home is still open because of him. Right. Because you wonder if he was the straw taken off the camel's back as far as staff, and that might be a little exaggerating, but for but, they can't take patients because there's not enough staff. Well, yeah, if you multiply in your small community, if you multiply him by more and more people, and then the kind of the generation effect of word of mouth getting to other people, overcoming this idiocy that low carb or keto is a fad, it's, it's evolutionary appropriate, that's why it fixes disease, but as it spreads, we're going to see more of this. I might ask you a question, John. If in America, 340 million people, whatever, I don't know the numbers of people over, say, 45, but if tomorrow everyone magically switched to a healthy, real foods, lower carb diet, magically, how do you think the chronic disease landscape would look like in just a couple of years if that f actually happened? It would be phenomenal. The amount of Having been a 40 pounds heavier um, person who 20 years ago I couldn't do what I can do today um, physically. So if you just imagine that everyone who does manual labor could just move that much faster and could go up the ladder one step quicker, it, it's hard to, hard to believe. And, um, and the fewer medications and then being bright in the afternoon. I mean, as a, I used to 
struggle with, I hope I don't fall asleep talking to a patient and I'd be telling my nurse, hey Jody, go get me a soda, you know, I mean, or I better go say hi to the ladies in the gift shop and tell them how much I appreciate them. No, I'm buying a Snickers bar. Candy bar, <laughs> yeah. And so, and that's gone. I, I tell my patients, you know, it's like, oh, today's a fasting day and it's 5.30 in the evening. Why don't we just stay longer and talk more? It's like, I'm wired. Yeah. <laughs> And you do start, you mentioned your hours, but nominally you're doing from... I start at 6 or 7 in the morning and go till 10 at night because of the paperwork. And the, um, if you're, the electronic record really stumps me because this is kind of a funny thing, is it doesn't acknowledge metabolic syndrome. So I have to, die, I have to talk about um, sometimes morbid obesity where the obesity is causing physical problems, the sleep apnea, the hypertension, the diabetes, the lipid issues which may be treated with medication, I have to put those in, those are like individual notes in the record. And so it's tedious documenting this, but when you're documenting success, somehow you just put your earbuds in, listen to your favorite mu music, and, and don't hate life. It's just like, can I get out of bed? You know, it's like, I can't wait for tomorrow. And that, that is the way to be, and it all comes thanks to basically knowledge and understanding of, of how the physiology really works, what the primary drivers of disease really are, and what the root causes that can be addressed are. And, and um, take, I gotta, this is funny about Gerald Reven, since um, we grew up just a few miles apart. Um, he's my, he, one of my science heroes who told the truth well enough that I think he, can, he was, had a good conscience, but he didn't tell the truth quite as loud as John Yudkin, who, and so I think Gerald Reven did it right. But um, by telling about metabolic syndrome, because when I heard him talk, it was like, I, you are just confirmed that it's, you can't fix this except with diet. And this was like about three or four years ago, and this is the sad thing is that he published posthumously in a journal, his name was on an article last December or November, about surrogate markers for insulin. And it's like, and I work in a hospital where insulin is now. We don't estimate insulin by looking at HDL cholesterol or triglyceride to HDL ratio. We don't measure insulin. I look at those numbers. But those, can, those are only so sensitive. And if you look at the insulin directly, and here Gerald Reven didn't, uh, he was still working on finding out how we could predict insulin levels, and now the technology is here, and the ex it's, um, it's amazing. And to have that in our hospital is phenomenal. You, you know, like I was saying, pairing it up and with all the other metrics to help people say, work a little harder, work a little harder, you're burning fat, your insulin's down, watch the fat melt away. Mm. So gratifying, yeah. yeah. No, saving people and knowing what you're doing, not handing out a, a kind of pills that you're not really sure, to be quite honest. You just know they should help, so it's off your back. Right. But insulin, I think, I agree, it's fantastic now. They can be measured so readily in yeah. your hospital. Yeah. I think across America and the world, insulin measurement is still resisted, so that's a challenge. The understanding across all the doctor population, probably the vast majority are not enlightened like you. That's another big challenge. And the calcification scan to actually see the disease and find the people at risk. The AHA 2018 guidelines, fantastic, but there's a long ways to go too. But we're on the road now, I think. Because the problem with insulin is that it is a nutritional fix because Pills don't, drugs don't do much about lowering insulin. And when you start looking at what insulin does, um, it is, has these harmful effects throughout the body independent of even what we measure. Like what insulin is doing to the kidney is just independent. When I was in medical school, I can remember back in 87 hearing the nephrologist giving a lecture saying, at the time of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, there's already kidney damage. Well, it was, he was implying that it isn't the sugar alone that bothers the kidney, it's the insulin. 
but that wasn't said but then that's still it, for some reason you have those little blips in your memory where you think oh that explains something I heard ages ago and one of my interests in back to the hyperinsulinemia is it's a direct harmful effect on the heart and I have only read a few papers on it but to me I just when I hear the word heart failure I just say what's your insulin level and it's up and oh the literature is full of checking insulin level when somebody rolls in the ER and you know if they're gonna make it or not Wow! like I, C peptide if you have a because if your blood sugar is really high when you're having a heart attack and you're diabetic that's to be expected but if it's really high and you're not diabetic they, they just say oh that's bad outcome well hyperinsulin or high blood sugar is a, a sign of stress and so that means that it's a worse heart attack so even looking at the labs you just see so many things if you can go physiology instead of um, what's the right med to hide this number under the carpet yeah, it's going back to an old age of, of medical doctors where they really had to be root cause specialists uh, and find out what's going on and look more at lifestyle. But now there's so many meds for so many things, in fairness, and they're so busy and stressed in the system. It's extremely hard for medical doctors to try and do extra research, find the answers and spend time with patients and lifestyle. I, I think they're just overstressed. Right. And I also point out to patients, I go through this little talk really quickly of saying, um, because I don't want to cast the profession into a uh, hazy light, because one is I've studied the history well, so I understand how we got here. I'm, I'm less critical by just seeing how did you, we get lost. But also at the same time, if you show up in an emergency department with an acute medical problem, like you show up with chest pain, quickly the emergency room doctor is going to say is it MI, pulmonary embolus, aortic aneurysm, pneumonia, pneumothorax, you know, on down the line. They'll drill down to a root immediate cause. They will treat you and whenever I see somebody in clinic that's been in the emergency room and they say, oh they seem to be so fast or they didn't, you know, I say, look, you, we're sitting here talking, they did their job. Their job was to get you with life and limb to sit with me now I've got it a little tougher because I have to try and get you figure drill deeper so what I'm trying to say is the medical profession does stellar at keeping people alive in the emergent situation and we got lost by taking that same philosophy into the chronic and you can't fix chronic with drugs yeah a quick intervention as a first step Yes, absolutely. And because we have to have the drugs. Yeah, and an antibiotic, in fairness, is an example of a drug that can fix the local short-term problem and, and then it's resolved. But of course, chronic disease, the drugs are relatively weak and ineffectual. And the only real thing is you need to fix the driver. Yeah. Yeah, but I agree. And it came up in the Widowmaker movie about, about the calcium scan as well that uh, Professor Budoff has said many times, you know, we are doing fantastic work you know, with acute events, yeah. saving people's lives, you know, getting in there with catheters, opening up, and that's fantastic, but, but we just need to get the system to work on the preventative as well, because that's how we're gonna save them before they ever end up there. Yeah. Right, yeah. So it's all those, um, that sense of well-being and control. That, and I should also say, living in where I do, you couldn't do better than being, we live at, um, in the area that's famous for Lewis and Clark when they were almost going over the mountains to the um, west coast and so we live in an area that's very clean environmentally because there's nothing upstream from us so we have access to not to good meat you can garden it's high desert and so it's a great place to say to folks what did your grandparents do let's do that and they, they actually remember it's not multi-generational you can go back and it's like I have plenty of patients that have milked a cow and raised hogs and so I say to I always go through the little deal is tell me about how that how that worked the milking the cow the skimming the cream the skim milk going to the hog 
What else did, what did you have to buy for the hogs? Grain, okay. What did you have for breakfast? Literally, somebody will say, cornflakes and skim milk, you know. So I live in, and work in a place where you can just spin it around and say, look, if it made a pig fat, it'll make us fat. And, and that's the joy of um, working in a place where it's, we're not in a food desert, I must say. It's, if we're, it's a, we're in a pretty much a where if there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, I mean. And so I, it's a good place to test things. Yeah, you can steer people back to the real food of our forefathers. And it's out the window. Yeah, relatively easily, and they understand. Yeah. Uh, I guess everyone, even in those areas which are not food deserts, you know, they were, they were just beguiled by the modern foods and without knowing it, they slipped into them until ultimately they have to suffer the diabetes, obesity and, all, and heart attacks that yeah. go with those fake foods, I've heard yeah. they're called. One of my rancher patients, he was one of the first ones that was just a word cured him because it was just like, oh, you're right. And he, that, you know, he, he didn't, it didn't take much for him to realize that he should just be eating his own, the work of his hands. And he came back a year later for his annual physical, and it's like, oh, my migraines are gone. I feel great. You know, it's like, and it's like, wow, I wish it was all that easy, but he wasn't addicted. All he just needed to be told was processed foods don't work for you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't happen that much. 90% yeah. of my work is trying to get people to a point where they can see, oh, I, it's an addiction, and I and it's worth, I have a goal, something, a reason to put it behind me. Yeah, to be motivated, understanding gives you motivation because you understand what's happening and you are enabled to tackle it. Some people still may not tackle it, a small proportion, but most people do not want to be fat, do not want to be sick, they want to live for the grandchildren. And once they're explained and they understand what the problem is and how to tackle it, many people are gonna be successful. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and also the community tipping point of saying, this is one of my dreams is, will you refrain from taking carb food to potlucks where that will hurt your neighbor? And Ben Bickman gave a good talk at BYU on the subject. And it was so funny because, um, and I, you know, I shared that with a lot of patients. It's like, here's a world famous fat metabolism researcher saying, ah, take care of the body you've been given. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because those that's the killer is um to not offend people you know and that's from i know now we're maybe are rambling a bit but i'm great at that is the but that's the cultural part where you just say if there's going to be sugar starch at a function it should at least be in a separate dish so that you don't have to fish the corned beef and cabbage and out from the potatoes. <laughs> yeah, the healthy foods should not be mixed in. And, the, and people, and society as well, there's, there's a backlash that some of it is being encouraged by industry and some of it is just human pride, not wanting to admit we're incorrect. But there's a societal pressure against things like low carb, things like keto. There is a sense that, you know, we're not comfortable with this. It's a fad because they have spent 50 years being told to do the opposite. And people resist that they and their society have all been wrong for 50 years. It, it's a bad feeling. So you get this pushback. And of course, industry is funding various campaigns to keep that pushback. But you know what? I think, John, the next 10 years, we're going to see a load more doctors doing the kind of things you're doing. And, and I really feel it's going to kind of get a tipping point in the next five or 10 years. What do you reckon? Definitely. When a patient came in that I've been working with for at least four years with her easily controlled from a technical standpoint type 2 diabetes and I couldn't get through to her and then she comes in, she and her husband come in and say, we're keto. And I said, what made you change? And she said, oh neighbor, she lost 30 pounds and um, got off her diabetes medications and I'm happy because I don't... I don't need to have been the one that communicated it to her. And when my patients said, we went to the truck stop this morning, had bacon and eggs, no hash browns or toast. It's like, that's a quote. And even I have had another patient come in and say, oh, two patients 
they're friends. They're both my patients, both have serious diabetes problems. And one of them goes, we know it's what you eat and when you eat. And it's like, oh, that's one step closer to success. Because if you're making, if you in private are making fun of me, that's one step from listening. The, yeah, for sure. No, I get you. Because yeah. if that's what, because isn't it true? I mean, with Jason Fung's work, it's what you eat and when you eat, and the when is huge, you know. And so, um, and that's so when I hear these people talking this stuff, and like, then it's starting to filter out where it's word of mouth, and when it's coming back in, you know, people say. To, I had a guy on, say to me on the street, really like what you do. And it's like, what's that? And it's like, well, my gut's gone. And it's like, I notice your shirt's flapping in the wind. <laughs> that makes you happy. Absolutely. They, it, it's, it's beginning to go not just from you to patients, but it's beginning to come back indirectly from third parties. Yeah. Now, that's, that's really important because you can only do so much. A single person can only do so much. But if that kind of catalyzes by people converting other people, then you get the wisdom of crowd spreading. So that's what we need. Right, and being a big reader, I just read a book on the crowds are scary, you know, because they can turn into a riot, but they can also t be a tipping point of success. Yeah, and groundswell. Yeah. And I, I think it's coming for all the efforts of industry and the ludicrous articles we see in the media that are anti what we're talking about, which means they're essentially anti helping population health. Yeah. But there's organizations who are who have a lot of money at stake and that, that's okay. They're fighting to keep their turf. Uh, but the reality is it they're not going to be able to stem the tide, I think, because the N equals ones are growing. You're converting other doctors. Once doctors convert doctors and you've got seven or eight percent of doctors are kind of knowledgeable like you, then the whole medical profession will probably start tipping over. And everyone respects doctors. So when the medical profession starts tipping over, you know, they'll override the even dietitians who are giving the same old pyramid advice. The doctors will override the dietitians. And thankfully, our, um, that was probably another thing that it intuited because I get to, tend to be over enthusiastic and really run off at the mouth on this subject. <laughs> and so in our community, our dietitian and um, exercise folks, um, they, I worked with them and gently shared with them what I was learning. And it was a long process, you know. So um, I try to do that is um, not to browbeat and more just be like, people just be enthusiastically share the latest neat thing. And then I love when my colleagues come to me and say, oh, we saw it too, we saw it too. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, anyway, may there be many more happy moments as, as the whole world switches over, John. And, and I must oh. say, um, uh, listening to engineers is a good thing. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it, but... Uh. <laughs> because, no, the mentality. And I was in engineering as an undergrad and got distracted from it. Um, but I still had the engineering mentality. The mindset. Yeah. Had, yeah. Mm. And if you um, saw... Yeah, it's just I like that mindset. Um, and so medicine can use some of that. Excellent, yeah. Well, I mean, the best example are Dr. Michael Leeds, Dr. Ted Naiman, Dr. Bernstein. There are oh. so many uh, originally engineers turned doctors, and it's probably not a coincidence that they're all amazing guys, just like yourself. But we're going to catch you up again, again John. Yeah, yeah, Thank okay. you, John. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.